Well, we are in Advent season. Advent means arrival. And I thought it would be fitting. We look at Advent, we look at the celebrations and the way they're usually mapped out. We go through the Advent, the arrival of Messiah, the arrival of the babe in the manger. What I think I have never seen is a church service that talks about the second Advent. So the word Advent itself means arrival. It's an appearing or coming into place, according to gotquestions.org. They say Christians often speak of Christ's first Advent and second Advent. That is, his first and second comings to earth. His first Advent would be the incarnation, Christmas time. The Advent season lasts for four Sundays. It begins on the fourth Sunday before Christmas, on the nearest Sunday to November 30th. Advent ends on Christmas Eve, thus is not considered part of the Christmas season. The Advent celebration is both commemoration of Christ's first coming and an anticipation of his second coming. As Israel longed for the Messiah to come, so Christians long for their Savior to come again. So is this important, and, and why is it important now? I thought it would be important now since uh, I have the opportunity to look at Advent and to introduce Second Advent, that this season would be fitting considering the world and all the things going on around us. I mean, really, we have to be blind and not see how the world is spinning out of control and, and worse than any time in history globally speaking. And uh, in keeping with that, I thought it'd be good for us as believers to revisit what's going to be a joyous occasion for some, but not for all. Our home passage is going to be in Revelation 19, and it's going to be verses 6 to 16, but we aren't going to stay there. In fact, we might not get there for a minute. So is it important? It is when you consider what it means to the believer. I, um, one of my favorite verses is Titus 2.13. expresses how we long for our deliverance, looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is in my heart continually. This is not my home. This is not your home. We should long to go to the home that we've not yet seen. First John says that he that has this hope or expectation purifies himself. So is it important also for the unbeliever? Well, it ought to be, because the unbeliever has no idea what is coming upon the earth. One fifth of the scriptures prophetic. There are some 1,845 verses that address the second coming. So it's a huge swath of Scripture to just overlook and not preach, not talk about, right? And it's our glorious hope. So despite God's consistent, faithful completion to date of all of His promises, there are those, even within the church, fulfilling 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7. In fact, I had somebody attack me on social media yesterday because, oh, you guys, you know, I've been watching that second coming stuff and Bible prophecy for 40 years and it hasn't happened yet. We need to just move along. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 7, knowing this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where's the promise of us coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of, 
of the water by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of godly men. You'll recall Jesus talked about how that in the end, it would be as in the days of Noah. Peter just said the same thing. So, silly self-styled prophets, prophetesses, date setters, have all but guaranteed that most of the more cautious pastors will preach on it. God forbid, teach the book of Revelation from the pulpit, lest they fall under criticism. Sadly, most pastors are uncomfortable with teaching what they themselves have not learned much about in Bible college because they too shy away from teaching the book of Revelation for the same reasons. So far too many self-proclaimed prophets and prophetesses are willing to put the rapture and the second coming into modern day second advent calendars um, for their own design. They, they overreach and they include dates that aren't in there and they create the mockery that we see. Some have even put billboards up. October 19th, Jesus is coming, the rapture. You think Satan does not use this and count on it? So, my God, it's obvious that he does. Of the more than 100 prophecies dealing with the first advent of Christ, all of them were fulfilled precisely literally, not figuratively, not symbolic. It was all literally fulfilled. Um, his riding on a donkey, the parting of garments, the piercing of his hands and feet, and the vivid prophecies of his rejection by men in Isaiah 53, all these might have been interpreted symbolically by Old Testament scholars before Christ. But the New Testament record reveals the prophecies were fulfilled literally. So all this was done, according to Matthew 26, 56, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. On one extreme, we've those too quick to pounce on their dreams or headlines, um, stars in the sky, rather than doing the diligent work of, of searching the scripture. On the other hand, we have another bunch too ready to symbolize away the second advent prophecies into some murky, indefinable sort of so-called apocalyptic literature. After all, nobody can really understand what it means definitively, so we just kind of brush it under the carpet. Um, not talk about it. So there are about three times the amount of second advent prophecies than Jesus's first advent, three times. So we spend this time of year, rightly so, looking at the first advent, Jesus's arrival, but we don't really talk about the second coming. There's three times more prophecies concerning that. The first time Jesus came, he arrived as a helpless babe in the manger. The next time he'll arrive on a white horse as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So first and second coming of Christ contrasted. So first coming, Christ came to save sinners. Second coming, Christ comes to condemn sinners. First coming, Christ shed his blood. Second coming, Christ sheds his enemy's blood. Christ rides a humble donkey the first time. Second time, Christ rides a glorious white horse. First time, the devil has Jesus bound in Matthew 27 when they bring him in for his trial. Then Jesus has the devil bound in Revelation 20. First time, J Jerusalem is destroyed. Second time, Babylon is destroyed, Satan's kingdom. First time Jesus comes as a servant, second time Jesus is a king. First time Jesus is a lamb, second time Jesus is a lion. Jesus is rejected by the Jews, but received by the Gentiles. And the second time, he's rejected by the Gentiles, received by the Jews. First time Jesus turned down the kingdoms of this world, the second time Jesus rules the kingdoms of this world. 
first time Jesus established a spiritual kingdom. Next time Jesus establishes a physical kingdom. First time the king of the Jews is crucified. The next time the king of kings, he reigns. First time he receives a crown of thorns. Second coming, he receives many crowns. First time Jesus lies in a manger. Next time Jesus sits on his throne. So what are the circumstances within these, these various prophecies that we have, some of them anyway? Are they being met? Where are we, where are we now? We're going to look at the conditions, the consequences, and we're going to look at the coming. So with the conditions, you know, there's several sermons that would require to talk about all of them, and we're not going to do that. But some of the conditions that we see are both Jesus and Paul described in times events as being uh, like birth pangs. So what we see is we see an increase in intensity and closer and closer together, more and more of these types of events. Sure, all these things, wickedness in the world has always been here, right? We, we've had people who worship Moloch, laid their babies on their red hot arms of a statue, that kind of thing, and worse. But this is more global is what we see starting to happen now. So what are some of the things Paul told Timothy about? In the latter times, uh, departure from the faith, uh, heeding deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, lies in hypocrisy, conscience and seared as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, um, commanded abstinence from some foods. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy excuse me, he says, um, they're going to be perilous times or times of stress. Boy, isn't that true? People will be lovers of themselves, you know, selfie lovers, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, no self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than God, pseudo-godliness while denying its power, taking advantage of gullible women, led away with lust. And we see human trafficking, too, that fits some of that as well. Um, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus talked about an increase in the number of false messiahs, wars, and rumors of wars, ethnicities against ethnicities, Countries against countries, famines, pestilences, diseases and viruses, earthquakes in unusual places, Israel hated by all ethnicities, many are offended, betrayals, hating one another, many false prophets deceiving many, lawlessness will abound, love of many will grow cold, the gospel will be preached in all the world. The abomination spoken of by Daniel in the Holy of Holies, which, by the way, that means there's going to have to be a temple in Jerusalem before you can have that. Believing Jews will have to run for the hills. The great tribulation, Jesus describes, such as had not been from the beginning and not worse for the rest of the time. So it's got to be worse than both world wars. So it can't have been back in 70 A.D. False prophets will rise with deceiving signs and wonders. And then in verse 29 of Matthew 24, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those, of those days, second advent, the sun and moon will go dark, massive meteor showers, etc. So those are just some examples concerning the end. All of these events are more right up to the point of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that it's near at the doors, and that this generation will by no, by no means pass away till all these things take place, meaning all these things will take place within the generation that sees from the end 
he describes the second coming in there and to all the beginning of the events that he first started describing in that chapter. So sometimes people want to say, you look at the word for, for those Greek geeks out there, the word generation is genea. You can use that Greek term and you can demonstrate how genea is talking about a specific people, a specific nation. You can do that, but it also means age. It also means just plain generation. And so when it does this, you got to look at the context of what's going on. And he says, whoever this is, and you can try to nail down and say, no, he was just talking to Israel. He was just talking to Jews at the time. Well, you can say that. That's fine. But Jesus still said that those people who see these things will not pass away until they're all fulfilled. It's that generation. So whoever is around to see the beginning of those things will be around to see the end of those things. So whoever is around to see the beginning of these things with um, things like Israel coming into the land will be around to see the second coming. So by extension, all these things take place within the same generation either way. We'll see the abomination of desolation. That's the, the man of sin, Antichrist, standing in the holy place all within the same people who see these things taking place. Again, like I said, for that to happen, you have to have the temple. To get the temple, you must have Israel in the promised land, right? Not just the promised land of Israel, but also in Jerusalem. Isaiah 11 says that God will bring them back a second time. Not a third time, not a fourth so if God promised them he's going to bring them back a second time, who's over there now? Are they there or not? Well, DNA says they are. You know, a lot of people don't trust DNA, but God says, I'll bring you back a second time. So somebody's over there now. We also says, we also see in the scriptures that the Lord says in Isaiah 35, you can also look at Ezekiel 36 and 38, God said he's going to bring them back into a desert. Pop quiz. Is Israel a desert now? It is not. I mean, the sections that have been handed over to Palestine are a desert again. Jews get them back for a little while. They get it working. It's green, plump, full of vegetation. Palestinians whine that they want it back, so-called Palestinians. They give it back to them. It becomes a desert. But Israel as a whole is not a desert. They can never again go back into Israel into a desert land because it's not a desert anymore. It was in 1948 when they first came in. So we are looking at that generation now. So for the believer, look up and be positive and be happy that, boy, the time is close. And I know you're tired and you're weary and we see the things going on in, the, in this world. But we have God's promise that this generation that sees all these things, all these things take place, will not pass away before we see the coming of the Son of Man. Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And thus he did it. And that's in Ezekiel 11. So what are the consequences? Most of that is about the world, what's going on in the world, and it's also about Israel. Well, you know, for the believer, who can be either Jew or Gentile, right? We here in this room, what, what does that mean for us? What is it? We're talking about second advent. We're talking about second coming. But also consider, if you can look there if you want, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, for the believer. Behold, I tell you a mystery, and you all know this verse, this passage probably. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. That is the rapture, the Master's Church. We believe in the rapture, that that's what it's describing. And in John, John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
So he says, I will receive you to myself. So that's a different event than the second coming where I'm coming down to you. Um, this is one that gets overlooked often. Revelation 3.10. Revelation 3.10. And to the church of Philadelphia, verse 7, he says, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key to David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and kept my word and have not denied my name. This is to the faithful church toward the very end at Philadelphia. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you. I will keep you from the hour of trial or tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world. Another pop quiz. If it's something, a tribulation that's coming upon the whole world and he's going to keep you from it, how's he going to do that? Yeah, I guess he could put a force field around everybody, right? Put us all on a rocket and launch us all to another planet? To test those who dwell on the earth. That's the purpose of it. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Quickly is tacos, where we get the word tachometer, like a tachometer. So things, these events start happening, and it's going to happen rapid fire and rev. I'm coming quickly. When, I, when these things start happening, it's going to happen fast. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him a new name. Now, just so you know, where he says, I'm going to keep you out of it. Okay, this is another one for you Greek geeks out there, if it matters. So when he says he's going to keep out, it's terio ek. It means to take away entirely. Now there's aerial ek, which means um, he's going to take you out. But this one means he's going to keep you out, not take you out. So you're not going to be in the tribulation, and then he's going to take you out. He says he's going to keep you from it entirely. Another thing it's not is Ario Apo, which means take from, similar to the other one. Terio N means keeping you in. I'm going to make you go through it. It doesn't say that. Terio Dia, I'm going to keep you through it. Um, Noah on the ark, he's, he kept them through it by putting them on an ark. They had to go through it, but he kept them through it. And it's none of that. Terio Ek, he's going to keep you out entirely. So we're not going to see any of that tribulation. So that's what it means for the believers. So before the second advent, there's all that. And guess what? As believers, we don't go through it. But then if you're an earth dweller, what are the consequences? It's, it's not going to be good. So this is why we share the gospel and we preach to the whole world. We all have loved ones where we care about and we're praying for. This is This is where... We as a believer have to gut check ourselves and say, Lord, I'm a, we're good, right? We're good. I have really have genuinely turned my life over to you. I've converted to Christ. I'm yours and we're good, right? Because if not, and there's any doubt, now's the time to get that corrected. Okay, so again, why aren't we going through that? Uh, let's look at a couple other verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 16 to 18. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and who are left, will be caught up. Rapture is not in the Bible. There's no such word as rapture in the Bible. Well, caught up in the Greek is harpazo. And it's from the root in the Latin Bible, Rapio, or, yeah, rapio, in the Latin Bible, and it's where we get the word rapture. So that's the root word, and that's where it comes from, is the Latin. 
I'm going to make sure I got that right, rapio, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Again, people mocking will say, well, how many second comings are there? Well, when he comes in Revelation 19, he's coming and his foot sits down. And the mountain splits. This time we meet the Lord in the air, and that's a different type of a situation. And then the very next verse, if you continue into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5 says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's the time of judgment, the tribulation week of judgment upon the earth, so comes as a thief in the night. The thief in the night, it does mean it's a surprise, but it's not going to catch us unaware and catch us off guard. We're watching, right? And it's not bad stuff that happens to us. The thief in the night, who it catches off guard, is like in uh, Matthew 37, 24, verses 37 to 44. Jesus tells us, as with Noah, Jesus said, they will be going about, life as usual, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they didn't know until the flood came. So thief in the night is like that. It catches you completely off guard. What this means for the church, the bride of Christ, is that we are that which is precious that's taken, the thief takes out. And they'll be caught off guard. Going back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of day, we are not of the night or of darkness. Amen. Jump down in verse 9. It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And we've already been saved. He's talking to a church. This means deliverance. Uh, clearly, he's talking about deliverance here because they're already saved. We're already saved. We already have eternal possession or um, possession of our salvation. So, we will obtain salvation or deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, which means we die, we live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify each other, just as you're also doing, which is kind of a ridiculous statement if you're going to be going through the tribulation, right? So he says, I have no need to tell you. Comfort each other. These are terms that have to do with, as believers, we can be comforted. This is what the second advent means to us. It starts early for us. We get a little preview. We get taken out early. In his uh, follow-up letter, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul steps in to clear up still more confusion. And uh, this is where the consequences of the coming is. In uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Lord had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, or the second coming, will come will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin, Antichrist, is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worship so that he sits on the throne in the temple as God, showing himself that he is God. We see this fulfilled in Revelation chapter 13. But it's just as Jesus described in Matthew 24 when he's talking about in the Olivet Discourse, he's talking about that 70th week, what he talked about in Daniel. Daniel 9.27 tells us that he's going to make a one-week covenant or agreement, and it's going to be a peace agreement for Israel. In other words, 
don't believe the timeline lie that false teachers in, in churches are telling you, but the second coming, which is the culmination of the day of the Lord, there will be a last week of years, a seven-year tribulation of wrath upon the earth that consummates on this, in the second coming. So chapter 2 of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians continues, verse 5, it says, um, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he, Antichrist, may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness, it's already at work, but he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Who is he that... Who is a he who is both powerful enough and everywhere at once to restrain evil? Only God is powerful enough to do that. Most scholars will agree, well, that's the Holy Spirit. He's powerful enough and he's everywhere at once and can restrain evil. But he's going to be taken out of the way in that ministry. He's not going to be removed off the earth. He certainly isn't going to go off the earth without me. Verse 8, and then... The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. So now we, that was all introduction. So now we do go to our key passage in Revelation chapter 19. So that was introduction, but the sermon's short. Revelation 19, let's take a look beginning at verse 6. And as I, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. In other words, it's as good as done. He hasn't sat there and he's not on the throne yet, but this is it, folks. And God makes a proclamation that he's going to do something. It's as good as done, right? Just like our salvation. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So in the wedding tradition, what happens is, is that, in the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition, is that the bride and the bridegroom are locked away in the Father's house for one week, not, not three and a half weeks, not for any other time period than for the full week, not three and a half days, I should say. So for the full week, seven days, they're locked away. The door's shut. Nobody else can go in. Uh, even if some of the foolish versions come in late because they didn't have their oil and they're locking on the door and say, I don't door's shut. You've missed the boat. So then at the end of that week when the celebration is done and they've been feasting and all of this, then the doors are thrown open to the father's house and her veil is back on and there's a formal presentation Behold the bride, now wife. She's unveiled. Everybody's yay, happy. Tables are set for the public now, though the invited people coming in. And those will be the believers who made it through the tribulation, mostly Jews, are going to be guests. And they're going to come and celebrate at the end of that. So that's why they're celebrating. They're saying what they are about, about the marriage supper of the Lamb. The lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. She's a wife at that point. Verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness, the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. As John is beholding this vision that God has given him about the end. But he said to me, see that you do not do that, the angel says. He says, I'm your fellow servant and your fellow brethren. Don't bow down or worship me. I'm a servant just like you are. Who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus. 
is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. He's faithful. He's going to complete the prophecies just as he said it was. His promises to Israel, his promises to us to spend eternity with him. He's faithful and he's true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. So when he comes down, he's going to go about Moab and the area surrounding where uh, Petra is. There's Old Testament prophecies that you could research described. It's trampling the grapes of wrath. It says he goes around and he's above the earth and he's wiping out armies, probably some of the Armageddon armies that are waiting outside Petra that really, really, really want to get at the people who are hiding there in Petra. But they've been supernaturally, divinely protected. He wipes them out and the blood splatters up on his garments. Just like the wine press. If you're wearing a white robe, and you have a wine press in your backyard, and it's full of red grapes, and you get in there stomping around, you're going to get some splatter. And it describes that. And it describes also in the Old Testament the earth melting under his feet. So whatever he's doing, it's not going to be pretty for the unbelievers on the earth at that time, the armies that have gathered there. He judges and makes war. Verse 12 says, His eyes were like a flame of fire, Again, judgment, and it sounds like he's angry. And on his head were many crowns. He has a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. They don't do anything. We follow him on white horses but we don't do anything. He does it all himself. And his name is called the Word of God, just as John wrote in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he also wrote that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's his name. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has his robe and on his thigh a name written, and you all know this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Steve Lawson points out, at Jesus' first coming, he stood on trial before the world. At his second coming, the world will stand trial before him. So during this Advent season, we focus upon Jesus as the reason for the season. But though he arrived, that prophecy might be fulfilled. Jesus, Messiah, the Lamb slain for our sins, His blood shed for many on the cross. It's a glorious thing that he bore upon himself, the very wrath of God, and rose victorious over sin and death three days later. The wrath that he's going to be pouring upon the earth, the unbelievers in the future, Jesus already bore on our behalf. Praise his name. But for those not believing upon him, the wrath of God's justice awaits and unsatisfied. So much better to come to Jesus who bore our wrath than to stand before a living God with justice still waiting to be served. Philippians 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. It's his first advent, right? Being the form of bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, what a humbling thing to think of you sending your son 
on behalf of us, we who are so undeserving, that all this effort and work was done on our behalf, that we see Messiah come in the form of a small child who grew up to be mocked and spit upon and beaten to bear the burden of the cross, to be nailed to that cross, whipped and beaten, to endure all of that very wrath of the Father for all of us who are your faithful service. Lord, it's we ask that you would help us to keep this in mind during this season and every day. Again, as John wrote in 1 John 3, he who has this hope purifies himself. Lord, help me to be pure. Help me to live pure. Not because I need it to get into heaven, because Jesus was already pure on my behalf, but Lord, because out of love, it's the least you deserve. May I be faithful to you because you are worthy. And Lord, we we pray for those who we know who aren't ready. We are going to be stolen like a as if you're a thief and we're going to be taken out of the earth and they're going to find themselves in the middle of the worst time in history on this earth. All the ghastly things we read about in the book of Revelation and more. And Lord, thy will be done all for your glory. But you know, we all have loved ones that we, we pray for their souls, Lord, and we pray that you would call them to you. And pray for anyone in here who is unsure or who has not responded to any calling yet. Lord, may you call them and may they respond. And may you be glorified in their lives and in this church. May we be about your business in the world day to day, preaching the gospel especially as we see the days getting so short. And in this season, Lord, may we be examples to those family members and loved ones around us celebrating all the wrong things about so-called Christmas that aren't really part of Christmas. Help us to be wise in the things we say and the example that we set, all for your glory and all for your praise. For it's in Christ's most precious name that we ask. Amen.